tonight, if you saw the bulletin, I'm going to change the sermon just a little bit, and that'll probably be the one for next Sunday night, Remember Lot's Wife. But tonight I'd like for us to look at a passage together that comes from 2 Kings in the Old Testament. So as you are turning in your Bible, I'd like to share with you a story that I heard a preacher tell just a little over a month ago. And it has to do with a country church similar to this. That there was a gentleman that sat on the very back row, kind of back there where Jesse is sitting, and everybody called him Mr. Henry. Mr. Henry Ford was his name. He wasn't the original uh, Henry Ford, but that was his name, Mr. Henry. A lot of them may have referred to him as Uncle Henry and Cousin Henry, but he was well known in the country. And he was an entrepreneur, and he had well invested his money, and he was known for his money. Matter of fact, every Sunday, as the offering would be collected, he would reach into his pocket and pull out a wad of money that had a rubber band around it, and in between all that money was two quarters. And he would take those two quarters out, and the offering tray came and it was already full and he just dropped those two quarters and put the rest of the money into his pocket. Week after week, this was done. Well, in one of the board meetings, one of the deacons that had observed this week after week, he said, I'd like to propose that we do the offering different. That we start with at the very back and then come up to the front. And let's catch Uncle Henry off guard. Well, they all had agreed to that. So the next Sunday came time for the offering. And instead of starting up front, they went all the way back to the very back row. And Uncle Henry pulled out his money. And he was getting ready to get those quarters out. But he noticed that the deacon was standing there with the offering tray right in his lap. And he got all nervous. And he was trying to take that rubber band off. And so, and then all of a sudden, up above in that uh, ceiling there was plaster. And some of the ceiling chipped and fell and hit Uncle Henry right in the head. And so as it did, about half of that money went into the offering plate. Well, the deacon standing there and seeing that, he looked up and said, Hit him again, Lord, hit him again. <laughs> Well, I'm going to hit you again tonight with a Mother's Day sermon. It's still Mother's Day, and I want to close out this evening with a text that does talk about a mother, talks about a God-fearing woman, but she was in the trial of her life, and it was actually two problems that we'll see that she was facing hand in hand. And that she knew what to do and where to go. And that gives us a good reason for mothers that they should know where they can go to get advice and to, to get help. And, you know, I said this morning that a man's work is from son to son and that a woman's work is never done. Mothers have many responsibilities, don't they? They wear many, many hats. And how a mother does all of that, I don't really know. Uh, I know my mother was a stay-home uh, mother, and she had so much of a routine, but then there'd be things that would come up that would take away from that routine. But she always had food on the table. She always had the clothes done and hanging up in the closet, folded in the chest of drawers, and, and always had you know, the house clean and all of this, and, and just was a very hard worker. And a lot of mothers today probably have more responsibilities because they're working outside of the home. And they have very stressful jobs 
and then have to come home and to do all the responsibilities and the duties that they have in that role of motherhood. But yet we know that God can equip each mother to meet those needs and to be successful and to be faithful. Motherhood was the first commandment and the first command that God had given to Eve. Now some would argue and say, no, the first command was not to eat of the forbidden fruit, but that was told to Adam. But when it came to God speaking to Eve, He spoke to her about motherhood. And then something that was brought up today, and I had just thought about this this past week, that in the church we have mothers, but we also have those like the lady in our text tonight that we're going to read, that they are widows, that their husband has passed on and they are in that home by themselves. Maybe their children are hundreds, maybe thousands of miles away. And as all the mothers and young ladies were standing up here today, I sat right in front of Tony, and Tony mentioned that. And I thought, you know, how ironic that was that I just thought about that just a couple of days ago and started naming them and numbering them. And he said, we have quite a few widows in the church. And we do. We really do. And even though that a mother has responsibilities, we know that there are added responsibilities of widowhood. The increased load when the husband is not there, when he is gone. And such is the case that is before us tonight. With your Bible open there in 2 Kings, let's go to chapter 4 and let's read together the very first seven verses. And we see this happened in the days of Elisha that stood there after seeing Elijah going up into heaven and requested to have a double portion of his spirit. We read this here in chapter 4. It says, now there, now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass that when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. That means that it stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. I want you to go back to verse 2. And this is the title of the sermon tonight. <coughs> what hast thou in the house? What do you have 
in your house tonight that can be used for God's glory and for the upbuilding and the continuation of His kingdom. How has God blessed you as a mother and as a wife that you have in your house that you are to be good stewards of what He has entrusted into your care? Well, I look at this passage of Scripture again and I see three wonderful things about this lady. This mother, first of all, knew where to go in the time of need. Look again at verse 1 of chapter 4 of 2 Kings. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. This was a this lady was a preacher's widow, we might say, because she was wife of one of the sons of the prophets. What was the number one job of the Old Testament prophets? They were to be forth tellers, weren't they? They were to relate the message of God to the people of God. They did a very little foretelling of what would happen in the future, but they did a lot of forth telling. And so this lady had married one of the sons of the prophets and that he had gone forth to be a messenger of God, what we would relate to as the preacher of the gospel today. Now there are some things that we can note in this one verse of Scripture about her deceased husband, about this prophet, about this preacher of God. He must have been a man of faith because he served under Elisha. Was not Elisha a man that was full of faith? And that he was the understudy of Elijah? That when Elijah was carried up in that chariot of fire, that he stood there and that he took the mantle of Elijah's ministry and he continued it and continued to be God's spokesman to the people? And so Elisha was a man of faith, and those that worked with Elisha, they would be men of faith as well. We also see that he, that this deceased prophet that was married to this woman must have been fearless because he didn't have any money. And then third, he must have been hardworking because he died at a very young age. But then we come to the two problems that were working hand in hand against this widow. First of all, we see the problem of death, that she has buried her husband, that that companion that she had had for a number of years is now gone. There's going to be some changes that are going to have to come in her life. Things are going to have to be done differently. And so the added responsibilities have increased because now she's the only parent that her two sons have. And so that's more responsibility. And then not only was it the death of losing her husband, but also the debt that had encountered through his years of ministry. And we see that these are the two great burdens of life. And the creditor had come. She looked in her purse and she had no money. She had no money at the bank. And so the creditor said, well, you owe, your husband owed this much and the only way that I can get it is to take your two sons and to make them bondmen, to make them slaves, to work out this indebtedness. Do you see that she's dropped out of the frying pan into the fire as the old saying goes? She's buried her husband. She's now a widow. And now the creditor is going to come and take her two sons. She's going to be there all alone, all by herself. 
But we see that this mother, that she quickly sought the wisdom and the help of God. And blessed is the mother who knows where to go when her family is in need. And so this woman goes to Elisha, the prophet of God. And that leads to the second thing we see in this passage of Scripture. That this mother found the answer to her need was right there at home. Right there in her house. Look with me at verses 2, 3, and 4. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thy handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. We see that Elisha, he is considered and considering her problem. As she has come to talk about the creditor coming, he's already known that the husband has died. This is going to add more hardship and heartbreak upon her. And so he's considering, he says, what shall I tell her? What shall I tell unto you? He wanted to give the, appro the appropriate advice. He wanted to console. He wanted to heal that broken heart. He wanted to, to smooth out the anxiety level that had risen inside of her. And then we see that searching question that Elisha asked, What hast thou in the house? Brethren, that is a good question for all of us today. But especially tonight, that is a good question for the mothers. What do you have in your house that can be used for the glory of God and for the advancement of His kingdom here on earth. And what blessings has God given you? Well, one thing, I think that you would have a husband who loves you if he is still alive and you all are living together that there's a mutual love between you two. Also that there is enough food to feed the family. There's food in the refrigerator. There's food in the cupboard or in the cabinet. You can go home tonight and you can make up a, a meal. Now it can be something as simple as grilled cheese or it can be something as big as a steak and baked potato and coleslaw. Now if you're having the latter, you call the preacher to come over tonight because he wants to eat steak and baked potato and coleslaw. Okay? But you have food in the cupboard. You have enough money this week for groceries. You have a roof over your head. When that terrible storm came the other night, and there was wind, straight line winds, did you have to worry about protection? Did you have to find shelter? No, you were in that nice, comfortable home that you and your husband and your family live in. You had a place that you could go to downstairs that was safe in case a tornado come ripping through Shady Valley. Well, this mother had none of those things. She had a very negative answer. She says, Thy handmaid hath not anything. There are mothers and others with the attitude and it makes themselves miserable. Others get new things. I am deprived. I don't have a new car. I don't have a new house. I don't have this. And I don't have that. And they focus on the negative. But brethren, it's time that we put the negative Nellies to rest and that we rise up and be the positive Paulines. That we be thankful for what God has given to us and to use what God has given to us as good stewards. She said the only thing that she had in her house was a little pot of oil. That's a startling 
discovery. That is the first positive, or second positive move. The first one was to come to Elisha, and the second positive move is this. And I looked this up, and this is literally anointing oil. Maybe something that her husband used as a prophet of God. But this was the turning point for her. How long has it been since you've sat down and really counted your blessings? And I know that this is true of all of us, that we have been blessed beyond what we deserve. Amen. We have a whole lot more than we know to do with sometimes. And so it was that she just had just that little pot of oil. And she made that discovery. We need to count our blessings. Rediscovering the house, rediscovering the home, the family, love, the Bible, and prayer. The answer for lifting your burden may be right there at your house that can carry you through until the next day. Well, we see a mother that knew where to go in the time of trouble, in the time of need. Secondly, we see the mother that found the answer to her need was right there at her home. But the third thing we see in this passage of Scripture is that this mother found that the possibilities are unlimited when you allow God to use what you have. Look at verses 4 through 7. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Thou shalt pour the oil into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So when she went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons and brought the, the vessels to her, she poured out. And it came to pass that when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is no, there's not a vessel more. And they all stayed. And then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, Pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Oh, she's heeding the message of Elisha with faith. She tells her two sons to go out into the community, to go out into the homes of the neighbors, and to ask for pots. And if they were empty, that's great, but if the pot's got a little bit of something in it, pour it out and wipe it out and bring it in. Now, my mind goes a little bit wild here because I know that brothers like to compete with one another. I can see those <laughs> brothers going out and gathering pots, spinning their arms, and running as fast as they could to bring it back to their mother and say, well, I got three. Well, I got four. He goes back, he gets four, and his brother tries to bring in five, you know. They're in a competition that are going out to everybody, knocking on doors. You got an empty vessel? I need an empty vessel. And so maybe a little flower in there and that mother of that house dips it out and says, here you go, there's your empty vessel. And they bring all these empty vessels in from this little old pot of oil that she had and she kept pouring until that vessel was full and she would lay it over to the side and get another and fill it all the way up. And that oil never ran out until when? There was no more vessel to fill. God is not wasteful, is He? God always provides for what we need and then extra because He did to this mother, to this widow here. Because, and she closes those doors, and boy, that's the very thrilling moment there. And God took what she had and multiplied it, filling those borrowed vessels. She had enough, according to Elisha, to pay off the debt. And then the rest, she and her sons would do what? Live to live it. off of it. And I can imagine that it was enough to carry them to the end. Oh, how good God is. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. But many times we're too caught up, and we can't see that. What God will do with what you have. And let's be really honest here. Everything that you and I have, isn't it God's anyway? Hasn't God given it to us? 
And if we use it for His glory, what will He do? He will multiply it, won't He? When we obey Him, what will He do? He will multiply it. Just think of that boy that had that little lunch that day and how when Jesus prayed that all 5,000 men ate till they were full. You've seen some men eat, haven't you? They eat not one plate, not two plates, but sometimes three and four, don't they? But every man ate until he was full. And then what was left over? Twelve baskets. I can't help but think that each apostle probably picked up a basket of fragments that were left. What about Gideon? Had three, had 32,000 men to begin with, and God said, that's too many, and brought it all the way down to 300 men. I was going to face an army that they already outnumbered four to one to begin with. And then what about David? He was going to face that big old Goliath, that big old giant between nine and a half and ten feet tall. He was only about 5'11", 110 pounds wet. But he had a little sling in his hand. And he put a stone in it. And that stone, when he let go, he hit Goliath right in the head and it knocked him down. Now that stone didn't kill Goliath. Because you read the scripture, David took the life sword and cut the life's head off. That's what killed him. But it was that little sling and that little stone. See the smallest things that God can use when we give it to Him and for His glory and for His honor. Think about a small church such as this giving money to Ives and was able to send a check out for $5,000. Dollars. There's a lot of churches four and five times bigger than us that probably didn't send that much. You know how to give sacrificially. And God takes that and how is He going to multiply that many times at $5,000 to help those people? Whatever you have is enough for God. So what hast thou in thy house? What do you have at your home that can be used? for the glory of God and for the advancement of His kingdom. What do you have in your home that God has blessed you with? This is a very important day on the calendar. Now, I've often have said this and I believe this, that Mother's Day, yes, is one day out of the year on the second Sunday in May. But if you truly love your mother, Mother's Day is every day of the year, isn't it? Amen. When you respect her, when you remember her teachings, when you remember her faith, when you remember her zeal and her determination, when you remember the hardships that she had, and she would look to God and to pray, and there'd be enough food there on the table, there'd be enough clothes to go to school, and she never went to school naked. But there's always a way that has been provided because God does not waste. And God takes care of His servants. God takes care of His children. We don't have to beg for bread. We ask for this day our daily bread, don't we? And what does God do? He provides it. He provides it. Tonight we come to the end of this service. I want to extend an invitation to Song says, are you washed in the blood? No doubt, everyone here tonight has been washed in the blood, but there may be family members that you have, sons and daughters and grandchildren, nephews and nieces and neighbors and co-workers, that they have not yet been washed in the blood of the Lamb. They are not saved. They're not a Christian. Their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. Why not go out this week and be that watchman. And to let them know that they need to make that decision before it's everlastingly too late. And to encourage them because you only have the promise of the present moment. You don't have next week and next month and next year because it may not come. Or the Lord Jesus Christ may come back. And we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. 
But let's stand up right now, and if there's anyone needs to make a Christian decision, place membership here at the church, or just need some prayers, we'll give you the opportunity as we stand together. And as we sing, hymn number 128, verses 1 and 4, Are You Washed in the Blood?